I want to talk about trans activism and how it's getting completely out of control. Over the past few years, the rise of social media has brought with it a brand new definition of transgenderism. There's been a massive spike in interest and awareness around the trans phenomenon. And even our society's underlying concept of transsexualism, now called transgenderism, usually just trans, has been completely overhauled. It's been transformed into what we can now broadly call gender identity theory. Increasingly, if you ever do anything or say anything or believe anything or even sometimes just think something that could in any way be interpreted as in conflict with gender identity theory, you're met with massive attack. You're deemed a transphobic bigot and threats are made against your work, your livelihood, death threats are thrown at you and your family sometimes, actual physical violent attacks have taken place. It's totally crazy. And what's really crazy is that it's putatively people on the left, progressives, who are committing these violent attacks. So how did we get here? Let's explore the phenomenon of how trans activism went completely off the rails. <laughs> I'm here to enlighten you. I want to show you how a group of otherwise decent, well-intentioned people, young, woke progressives in this case, can manage to mutate into a dangerous, intolerant, sometimes physically violent cabal and not even notice that they transformed into the bad guys. And the best way to show you that is to start with knitting. We're going to talk about the online world of knitting for a minute, but trust me, just take a moment and you're going to see very clearly where I'm going with this and it'll pay off. So let's start. Recently, a journalist named Gavin Haynes produced an excellent BBC Radio 4 documentary about a phenomenon he's dubbed the purity spiral. A purity spiral, he explains, happens in societies and cultures that organize around a single value that has no upper limit. Okay, that sounds confusing, a value that has no upper limit. He gives lots of examples, uh, but one of them is the online world of knitting. Very recently, uh, there was a total meltdown in the online knitting community <laughs> on social media. A lot of knitters would get together and they would share their knitting patterns and talk about whatever it is that knitters talk about. And there was a young, gay, male knitter who was very sweet and very progressive and liked to share his stories of you know living with HIV and wanted to use the medium of knitting and talking and have a community of knitting to share positive stories. And he decided to create a hashtag called Diverse Nitty. Silly word play. That were, he wanted to encourage knitters of color uh, to share their stories because he found that the knitting community might be too white and not ethnically diverse enough. Well, what ensued, bizarrely, around this hashtag Diverse Nitty was a total, total feeding frenzy, a, a pandemonium of. Uh, attacks. Everybody was calling everybody else a racist. Uh, the hashtag just devolved into more and more outlandish accusations of further and further degrees of outrageously unacceptable racist behavior. Uh, this is a purity spiral. So in this case we have a community of progressive friendly knitters who organize around a value. In this case something like I believe racism is bad, but it has no upper limit. And what that means is that what can be defined as racism hasn't been, hasn't been defined. You could define racism as you know, actual acts of literal lynching, or you could define racism as you know just simple societal, social structural problems or microaggressions or that kind of thing. There hasn't been any you could take, you could accuse more and more benign behavior as being racist, essentially. And the other part of the value that has no upper limit is how bad you think it is. So one person might say something like obvious hatred of minorities is 
bad, and I think anyone who obviously hates minorities and expresses the hatred of them should be kicked out of the community. Okay. So like extreme level of racism, expressing hatred of minorities, an extreme level of action taken, kicking them out of the community. But those limits haven't been established. So someone else comes along and says, oh yeah, well, I think that even subtler forms of racism merit the same degree of punishment, expulsion from the community. Uh, and then someone else will come along and say, oh yeah, well, I think an even stronger punishment. I, I'm so anti-racist and I believe so much more fervently than you do that racism is bad, that I think somebody should be physically attacked. And it just escalates because this value, I believe racism is bad, has no upper limits on just how racist you have to be to be bad and how much you can be punished for it. People can vie to sort of take the moral upper hand by claiming to be taking this value more seriously than anyone else. And this is exactly what happened around the diverse nitty hashtag. And it devolved to the point where the sweet, young, gay, male, HIV positive, friendly person who created this hashtag with such good intentions, obviously, was driven to the point that he was literally suicidal and was considering committing suicide. And even more crazy, the furious activists who were all over this hashtag attacking him were basically still mocking him after they found out that he was being driven to suicidal ideation. They were still saying that he basically deserved to die. This is a perfect example of the purity spiral. Uh, and it's a funny one because, you know, naming community online, how can something so sweet and innocent as that devolve into driving a sweet gay male knitter who is living with HIV to want to kill themselves because they tried to spread a message of friendly diversity? What's even more interesting is that in this BBC Radio 4 documentary that Gavin Haynes produced covering this phenomenon, uh, a lot of the people who engaged in the online abuse didn't want to comment. Uh, they, I think now that the dust has settled, there's been a wave of sobriety <laughs> among these people realizing that they had gone over the top. But a lot of academics still didn't see that. Very interestingly, the documentary talked to uh, a professor of uh, racial studies. What was it called? Uh, Critical race theory. This is a professor of critical race theory. So the interviewer, the documentarian, Gavin, went to this professor and was asking him, you know, to explain a little bit about the language of anti-racist activism, uh, you know, terms like microaggressions and intersectionalism and that kind of thing, the language of the woke left, uh, to explain it in the context of critical race theory. Uh, and what was really interesting was that this professor just kept bringing the subject back to how everybody's racist, essentially, against black people, against people of color, against minorities. Uh, so the interviewer would point out that, okay, a group of people attacked a white gay man and drove him to want to commit suicide, and the professor's response was basically, well, yeah, well, racism is everywhere. Everybody's racist. There was no concept of proportionality, that there are degrees of racism, you know, that some acts that are considered racist are egregious enough to merit criminal prosecution, perhaps, and some are much more subtle and less malevolent in intent. Uh, if you're going to say that every single white person is racist, then you're obviously talking about, that you're not saying that every single white person is tantamount to an actual literal slave owner or lynch out carrier outer or somebody who commits lynchings obviously not you're talking about a much subtler degree of racism but there's no language in critical race theory to discuss these degrees and there's no language in critical race theory to discuss when perhaps activists have gone too far when they've said when they've taken actions against perceived racism that have been not been proportionate to the degree of racism that they perceived. Anything that they can define as racist, or anything that is perceived as even remotely racist, gets tarred with the word racist. And that word is tarred with 
absolute badness. They would line up a literal slave owner right next to somebody who maybe appropriated the wrong cultural something, wore a, you know, wore the an insensitive Halloween costume. They wouldn't distinguish between these two acts. They'd line you up against the same firing wall, essentially. And so you can see very clearly where I'm going with this uh, in terms of how it's affected trans activism. I believe the value that trans activists organize around and their allies is that famous sentence, trans women are women. And yet again, there is no upper limit to that statement. There's no upper limit to what you define or who you define as a trans person. The, the, the category is becoming broader every day. And there's no upper limit to how much you conceive them to be women. I think the sentence started out, trans women are women, the mantra, most people just believed it was a social uh, courtesy. Trans women are women because they're obviously males who want to be perceived by you as women, and you don't want to hurt these people's feelings because this is a vulnerable group. But the moral feeding frenzy, the bidding war, took off from there, where some people wanted to be perceived as more progressive than others and declared that they believe that trans women are women in more than just the social courtesy sense, but that they believe they really truly have no difference between men and women, between women and trans women. And then from there, they're saying, oh, you've got others saying, oh yeah, well, I define trans women as not just people who have experienced extreme dysphoria and distress of their gender and have physically transitioned and had surgeries, but I also believe that anybody who feels that they're trans is really trans. So it's going up. And then you've got somebody else saying, oh yeah, well I think even a part-time cross-dresser counts as a trans person, so that's a total woman. And then someone else says, oh yeah, well I believe that, and I believe they're literal biological females, and that actual biology is a fiction that was made up. And this is just a moral bidding war. Everybody has taken this value, trans women are women, and they're just trying to out, <laughs> outwoke each other by saying they're more and more committed to this sentence. And it doesn't make any sense. It makes absolutely no sense that we've devolved to the point where an entire group of progressive leftists are now denying that biology exists. I mean, even a year or two ago, you could have arguments with trans activists online and they would never insist that biology wasn't real. They just didn't want to be interpreted as women in a social sense and they wanted to be called women. Now they're saying they want to be called female. And now they're saying that biology literally does not exist anymore. That's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, just the other day in the United Kingdom, an elected minister of parliament, member of parliament, declared on television, alive on television, that babies are born without a biological sex. That's, that's nuts. How does that help transgender, transsexual, trans people in any way to go absolutely crazy around this trans women are women value? It's just, it's just completely nuts. One thing we need to remember is that on the left, virtue is our currency. Most people, our goal in life is not to acquire uh, physical things, not to acquire capital or to acquire mass material possessions. It's to be good people. That's the underlying motive for most people on the left. And what you end up with is essentially a market for virtue as a currency, as something that people trade in. People want to be seen as more virtuous than their peers uh, because there's power in being the most virtuous person. And that's kind of the way that people have organized their lives. Uh, so this is a real, this is the underlying cause of these purity spirals, is that people take a value, trans women or women, that value has literal, genuine currency. People derive power by demonstrating to their peers how much they want to adhere to that statement. And what you get is an all-out bidding war that descends into madness and chaos with people vying to say more and more preposterous things to prove their virtuousness around that shared value that trans women are women quite ridiculous, isn't it? 
So let's apply the notion of proportionality to that. If we want to say trans women are women, let's be proportional, proportionate about it. To go back to the phenomenon of the knitters, let's apply proportionality to that. Let's say this knitter came out with this diverse nitty hashtag because he wanted more voices of knitters of color to be shared in the knitting community. Well, if somebody found some fault in that, that it was somehow racist, I don't even know how they could, but maybe they believed that it wasn't the place of a white person to create the hashtag, or maybe they thought it would be better if, I don't know, if, if somebody found some fault within that undertaking, clearly that fault was pretty minor on the scale of actual literal murdering black people and holding slaves down to, you know, some kind of insensitive Halloween costume and who knows what's even less, uh, whatever. You know, having dreadlocks when you're white or something. Uh, it's somewhere on the bottom. And so if there should have been a proportionate response to that. Even if you did believe that what this gentleman did had in some way been an act of racism, it was pretty benign, pretty low level kind of racism that really deserved and merited some humane, some sympathy, some humanity, and if any response should have been made, it should have been proportionate and commensurate with the level of racism. That didn't happen, because there is no, <laughs> no understanding of proportionality and of uh, reasonable amounts of pushback against racism if your value is I am against racism. It's not I am against certain degrees of racism to certain degrees, or, you know, it's just all out, there's no upper limit. And the same thing with the trans women are women. You should set a, a very specific example of how trans you gotta be to count as a trans and how woman you are when we're saying you're a woman. Like, do you think you should be able to donate literal physical organs as though you were a female person? Should your blood be considered female blood even though male blood and female blood aren't always the same thing and people could literally die? I mean, is that how far we're supposed to take trans women and women? We should just start randomly pretending we can't tell the biological sex of people's physical organs <laughs> when we're transferring them to other patients. Uh, like, like, this is crazy. And the other one, of course, is transphobia. I don't like transphobes is the other value. I am against transphobia and I'm against transphobes is the, the other value that's shared by the, ant the, the trans activist community. But they make no distinction between hideous acts of genuine transphobia, like physical violence against trans people that is committed by, you know, ignorant men, ignorant, dangerous men, uh, and just simple, minor disagree. Maybe you have some reservations about the idea that a male-bodied violent rapist should be housed in a women's prison. Maybe that's like the, the, you have some reservations about that. And the trans activists won't make a distinction between a liberal progressive person who maybe has some slight reservations about the idea of putting male rapists in female prisons. No distinction between that and a violent man who physically assaults a trans person in the street. They would line you up against the same firing squad wall right next to each other. You're all transphobes. You're all bigots. There's no distinction. There's no gradation. There's no, there's nothing. There's just, once you get the word transphobe attached to you, all bets are off. You're, you're subhuman. And they're doing this because they're vying amongst each other to demonstrate that they're more virtuous than each other. Oh yeah, well I think, you know, transphobia, they're just taking the, what counts as transphobia to further and further extremes to demonstrate to each other how virtuous and how pure they are. It's a purity spiral. Yeah, I mean, it's it's totally crazy. And one solution is to at least talk to trans activists more about proportionality. Maybe get them to talk when they are going on about, you know, transphobia, to really outline and specify degrees of transphobia and degrees of reasonable response to perceived transphobia. Of course, once you start having these conversations, you're going to see that a lot of things that activists deem transphobic 
are really not phobic at all, are not bigoted at all, and do not come from a place of hatred of trans people. They're just disagreement about this crazy, brand new gender identity theory concept that really just emerged out of really bizarre queer theory in academia and got filtered through some very young social media networks like Tumblr and Reddit and has now turned into this totally incoherent uh, mess really that people are starting that people take seriously <laughs> and it doesn't even it's not even co it's not even structurally coherent within itself but if you have any criticism of it in any way if you have any criticism of the notion that your gender identity is something innate that you're born with and that that as a it has more intrinsic value than your biological sex in ver literally every single context of your life uh which just is i mean it's just crazy if you ask me what these people are actually professing to the, to believe in the name of demonstrating to their peers that they're virtuous i don't know it's just bloody crazy it really is crazy times <laughs>